Proverbs, the third chapter, verse 34. And it says, what, and this comes from the Septuagint, not the Hebrew Bible. This is a, a transliteration. This comes from the Septuagint, that which was James' Bible, and it was all their Bible. God is opposed to the proud, the arrogant. That would be verses four, uh, 1 through 5. But he gives grace to the humble. So now what he's going to do, he's going to show you the process of getting to humble. And we'll drop down to verse 10 where he gives his summary. He says, humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. So the idea between verse 6 and verse 10 is bringing a person that's engaged in hedonistic reversionism. Um, <coughs> what we call reversionism around here, <coughs> other churches would probably refer to as backsliding that comes from Proverbs 14. 14. Now, <coughs> but the, the idea of reversionism goes a little deeper into the concept of recovery. So, his idea in verse 6 is humility, and his closing statement, like you do in an a priori argument, is then humble yourself. Now, what he does between 6 and 10 is show you his view of what you have to do. Here's what he says. And what I say to you is very important now. Listen, my first loyalty is herm in hermeneutics is tell you what the writer says. Okay, that's the first law of hermeneutics. I must tell you what the writer says. Then we can determine how we're going to deal with it. But first we have to tell you what the writer actually says. Okay, so here's what he says. And what you look for is you look for because he's going to do something. He's going to attach to promises to certain things and certain things he's not. Now what he does is he gives you 10 aorist imperatives. An aorist imperative is one of the strongest commands that you can get, and it means it is to be obeyed. It's not up to you to decide something else. You must obey what I tell you. Do you understand that? Because when you read that, you might think that this is up to options. Well, I can submit if I don't want to submit, or I can take a different view of this if I want to take a different view of it. That's not possible. In an aorist imperative, it goes as stated. So here's what he does. He lists 10 of them. He lists 10. In, from verses 7 through, from 7 through 10, he lists 10. Aorist imperative is the strongest command that can be given and requires obedience to what was said. He says first, here's the first one. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So submit therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. There's a promise in there. In the second one, draw near to God and he will draw near. There's a promise there. Then he gets into cleansing. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning. Uh, that, that's a M-O-U-R, and your joy into gloom. And there are no promise given to that. He says, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and for joy. Then he comes to verse 10. He says, humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So we come back to a promise. So what he does is he gives you 10 aorist imperatives, which are sequential. Now, Usually when you do this, you pay attention to the sequences because they're in an order of importance to the writer. So we're going to assume that's true since it's set up like a, like a, um, like an offerary argument. He says, first, you must submit to God. Two, you must resist the devil and then he will flee from you. Three. You must draw near to God, and he'll draw near you. Four, you must cleanse your hands, you sinners. And then, and then he goes to five, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, that's one. 
mourn, that's another one. Weep, that's another one. Your laughter be turned. Be turned is the ninth one. And the tenth one is humble. Those are all aorist imperatives in the Greek language. So they're sequential. Okay? So it appears what James is doing is he's telling you that if you're in this mess, God's grace is getting great enough to do it. But you've got to, you've got to do these things. You've got to do these things. You've got to submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, cleanse your hands, purify your heart, be miserable, mourn, weep, and then turn your laughter into mourning and you join the gloom. This is how you, the, the imperative, this is how humble, you're, this is how humble, because he starts with it. God gives grace to the humble. This is how he's going to do it in your life, and then humility will come, okay? Then he gives the final command, uh, humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, as stated, this is a summary, and he will exalt you. What does exalt mean? will get you out of this place and this thing that you're tied down and can't get out of, this pleasure that you're in and can't get out of, he will exalt you from it. He will exalt you. He will, he will lift you up and out of it. Okay? So let's have a word of prayer. We're going to come back to the same study I did last week. Apparently it didn't ring a bell, so it's going to ring a bell tonight. So we'll look at it one more time. Okay, this is James' idea, and his principle is very good, greater grace. The issue is, how does it work? How do we get there? We're all for greater grace, that's for sure, and if we're in a muck pile of quicksand and we want to get out and we can't get out, there's no, we don't have the power to do it, then we, we're looking for a source outside ourselves to get us out of it. James tells us how to do it. And what he tells you is in the aorist imperative. It's not up to options. It's not, it's not up. You, this, it's not up to options. These must be obeyed. Okay? Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way to study with us the word of God. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our hearts as we look at the book of James. James, James Father, is in this, is it, it, there's no doubt within a struggle in the transitional period of the Jewish age to the church age, from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. We understand that. This struggle is going to go on within the church from 30 A.D. through 70 A.D. to 100 A.D. until the canon is completed. And then we have the new, the new Covenant established like we did the Old Covenant. But we're trying to understand this. What is James saying, and how can we interpret this to the New Covenant grace? And so, Father, we pray once again that you would encourage our hearts. Teach us the truth. The, the truth comes from the Holy Spirit. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I was pretty emphatic with you about this approach in the hermeneutics. I was emphatic on James' approach to recover from hedonistic reversionism, which some people call backsliding, from the span standpoint of new covenant grace theology now I have the I have the great privilege of being able to teach with a completed canon the complete I have a completed whole new testament that deals with nothing but new testament theology so I'm really privileged to be able to do this and you're going to need every bit of it to study the book of James because James is not in that period James is in 40 the church begins in 30 and James is in this struggle. He's in this struggle just like the disciples were in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as far as historical. So when we approach this, we approach it. James is in the middle of a transition. They're in the middle of a transitional period. There, there's a changeover of, of divine agencies, priest nation of Israel to the church, old covenant, new covenant. The priesthood is completely changed. The Levitical, the Mosaic laws, it's completely changed now. And James is struggling in this midst like a lot of the church was. They were really struggling. And the church was about to split and finally did over the issue of old, old covenant law versus new covenant grace. 
they, they will split. It is still split. We're still split on this issue. And it was supposed to have been resolved in Acts 15. Everybody believed it was, but it wasn't. So, one of the things I don't want you to mistake when I get on to James in this, do not mistake my approach to James as not believing that the book of James is an inspired word of God. Don't do that. I don't believe that. I believe it's inspired. But listen, when they went to canonize the New Testament, everybody that canonized the New Testament struggled with the book of James because it lacks New Covenant theology. They were not going to, listen, it took a long time to get the book of James in the Bible. It was the hardest book of all of them to put in. And some of them, like, the book, like James, didn't make it. Some of the books that are mentioned in the book of Jude didn't make it. <clears throat> so, everybody... Not just me, but any, everybody struggled with James because he lacks New Covenant theology solutions. If you're going to study the book of James with a completed canon, you spend most of your time supplementing what James is saying with New Covenant thinking because your people are New Covenant thinking. Everybody supplements it. So you got to be aware of that. My point about the book of James is that it's one of the most quoted books of the New Testament by legalism. This is their book. That shows you how strong that book is on their opinion. It is the book. They'll throw the rest of them away, but they keep this one because everything else is going to teach on grace. This teaches on law, and they know it, and this is their book. So when you go in it, you got to understand what you're fighting. The biggest problem that James is having is normal. It's, he's in a transitional period. Listen, the temple is still up. They're still running strong in it in 40. They're going to run strong till 70 AD. This is going to be a war until God comes in and takes the temple out. If you think the, the thing with Notre Dame is, is a big deal, think, think when, when God allowed the temple to be absolutely destroyed. But he had to do it apparently because people wouldn't move from Old Covenant to New Covenant. They wouldn't leave the law for grace. So he just took it out. He took the whole system out. <clears throat> so I said, it's important to understand. I'm not just saying that James is in a real struggle compared to where we are in a completed canon in a grace-oriented theology. And I try not to be too critical about that with James because he's in a struggle. And we've all, probably we've all had some struggle with law, versus grace in our life. So I'm not, not attacking James or his book or his writing. Anything. I'm trying to understand it. I'm trying to understand it, listen to me, from hermeneutics one and from history two. I know this book is written in the mid-40s and uh, the synagogues are, are going healthy and the temple is up and running and everybody's doing this and they're struggling with this. And, and I certainly understand it. But I believe like so many New Testament grace students of the word of God, that God put the book in James, here's my idea, and I'm not alone. All New Testament grace theologians, Bible students, believe this. That God put the book of James in, the canon, to challenge our New Testament theology of grace, because it does. If there's a book in the Bible that challenges, the only other book in there that challenges it like this is Galatians, and that's a light challenge. Because you got Paul in there going, boo, boo, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> you don't have it with James. You don't have another voice. And I think, for me, because every time, this is the second time I've gone through this book, and it's been a bugaboo every time for me. You have to supplement so much of New, New, New Testament theology in it. It's just unbelievable. And I don't know anybody. I know nobody that believes in New Testament theology that don't do this. I don't know anybody that doesn't do this. Every New, every new Covenant grace theolog theology teacher has to supplement New Covenant teachings when they teach from this book. Years ago when I taught this, many years ago, 
when I taught this passage in James, people gave me the doctrine on it by Bob Thiem. This year, I was given one by Gene Cunningham. Like, I didn't know these guys, and I don't, I don't read these guys, and I don't know anything about it. Listen, we all struggle with this. You know what Bob did with it? He supplemented New Testament teaching with it. You know what Gene Cunningham does with it? Supplements New, New Testament, New Testament theolo theology with it. Because you can't get it any other way. James ain't going to give you no New Testament theology. They all do it. Any New Covenant. Because you've got to teach to your New Covenant people. What are you going to do with all this mess? Cleanse your hands, you sinners. What are you going to do with that? In the aorist imperative. you got to explain it. Hermeneutical. You can't leave it down there. I can't. The first law of hermeneutics is tell the, tell the people what the writer's telling them. First law of hermeneutics. You have to be honorable to the teaching. So, last week, when I got to my point of summarizing what James meant, I took the teachings of Jesus. I did the parable of the prodigal son as a supplement to James' view. I chose to bring New Covenant grace view from the same period of Old Covenant teaching in order to teach cleansing based, based on the transition that it, cleansing now solely is on the blood of Jesus Christ. So I use the man himself as my example of what James should have learned by setting under the teachings of Jesus. But listen to me. James didn't set under the teachings of Jesus because he was an unbeliever until he was raised from the dead. You understand that? They didn't get out of this. And he'd been wise to gotten saved and believed in his, in, the, in his brother Jesus, but he didn't. And so he missed an enormous parable that would have been very helpful when he wrote the book, The Parable of the Prodigal Son. So I brought that in as my supplement rather than to take every little nitpicking thing in here. I just rolled it up in a big ball and showed you what Jesus said about the same thing in the same period. Hebrews 9.15, the writer says, how much more? You know what he's comparing that to? When he says, how much more? What do you think he's comparing that to? The old covenant blood of bulls and calves and stuff, right? Well, if you read Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 like we've studied, then you would certainly know that. And, and one of the great, one of the much more, one of the passages you should write down over much more than is Hebrews 10, 1 through, uh, Hebrews 10, 1 through 10. Because he goes, the writer goes into this because they're fighting this tooth and nail, as we might say. They're fighting law versus grace, and everybody's running to the old covenant and says, oh, you got to be a Jew to be a Christian. Everybody going like, no, you don't. So they're, they're telling everybody, you got to be a Jew to be a Christian. They go like, no. And if, and if they believe in saved by grace, then they're telling you, well, to, be, to live the Christian life, you got to keep the law. No. None of that's true. Not under, the new, not under new covenant theology of grace. That's not true. So when the writer of Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, I just pulled out 9. We talked about this at great length. How much more he's talking about is the new covenant over the old covenant? How much more will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God? Watch this now. Cleanse your conscience from dead works. You know what dead works is? In context, always context, Mosaic law. That's chapters 8, 9, and 10. That, that's all he's talking about. He's, he's, been, he's been running comparisons through the whole thing. Actually, it goes back to chapter 1 through uh, chapter uh, 10. But Now, let me come back. Let me come back. Let me come back to this. Let me show you something about James. <laughs> Nobody studies James. There's a lot to be said about James in the Bible, in the New Covenant Bible, in the New Testament. So let me tell you a few things about James, okay? The book of James was written somewhere in the mid-late 40 A.D. 
about 10 years after Pentecost, somewhere, somewhere in that length. At the church first conference, the first church conference, which is really important, was held in 50 A.D. All right? So we're, we're past... We're past the church being formed, and, and James is the pastor of the, of the first Jew, Jewish, the first Jewish Christian, church, the first Jewish church in Jerusalem. It was a mega church. We talked about that. James was the pastor of the Jerusalem church. He and Paul were the leaders of two groups. James was with the Jewish believers with Old Testament, Old, Old Covenant legalism and New Covenant grace, and they're struggling with it. Paul, on the other hand, is New Testament grace without Old Testament, without Old Covenant legalism. I mean, you read Paul's writing, he says, oh, no, 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 it's out. Okay? You go back to the law, you've nullified grace. Listen, Galatians, read the book of Galatians again. He's going he's gonna to wham it on you. Galatians 2.21, for example. You can't have. Listen, the law and grace are no more compatible than the spirit and the flesh. Or faith and sight. No more compatible. That's what we believe under new, new, new covenant theology of grace. We, we, don't, believe the, the, we don't believe any of it. Anybody worth the salt doesn't believe that. They came together, these two men, James and Paul, James and Paul, two leaders. They came together to become one mind on the message and mechanics of grace salvation, Acts 15. When you read verse 1, they had a problem. They were requiring everybody to be saved, had to believe the gospel, and be circumcised in order to be saved. Paul said, absolutely not. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God over and out. And they said, no, they, it's got to be that way. They talk about it in verse 1. They talk about it in verse 5. They settle it in verse 11, grace and grace alone. Grace and faith, faith alone. So you can read all this, you know, read all of it. Now, at this church conference, they had three speakers. You can read all this. It's in your Bible. It'll do you well to read some of this. Peter, Peter stands up and he preaches in chapter 15, verses through 10. Pay attention to verse 9 and 10 when he speaks. Paul gets up and speaks lightly on the subject in verse 4 and verse 12. James comes along and he, 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 he's, a, he's a final speaker and he's the final, you know, he's going to, everybody's on base and he's going to, Hit a home run. And so he teaches 13 through 21. Well worth your read. All spoke. All these three men got up and spoke. Then they wrote a unified church degree, decree. And here's what they said in the 15th chapter. And this is important. I want you to turn to it because it's important. Acts 15, 20. Listen to what they say. They all, these three leaders, agreed on this. All the elders of the church got together, and they all agreed on this. And this is what the decree basically says in verse 20. Here's what it says. But, but that we write to them, the Gentiles, we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornications plural, and from what is strangled from blood. That's it. We believe the Gentiles come in, but listen, to keep peace, they've got to have some attitude towards idolatry. You know, he mentions the three big, idolatry, uh, one, fornications, two, and anything strangled uh, with blood. The, and listen, everybody goes like, look, I can buy that. And so they all they bought out all into it, and I gave you other passages well worth your read. I don't have time to go into all this, but listen, I don't go and write all these things down there for no reason. If you want to know how all this fits together, you got to read all that stuff I put down there. I don't. I only got an hour. This would take a month. 
All right. I'm just trying to tell you what James says. Point number two. Now, on Paul's third missionary trip, now we're in late 50s A.D. Paul is on his third missionary trip, and we're in the very late 50s, 58, somewhere around there. This is when Paul took a special gift offering to Jerusalem. Listen to me now. This is so important. Against the directive revealed will of God not to do it. In Acts 21, he's told that in verse 4, and Agabus, the great church prophet, came along. You remember? Tied himself. You remember that whole deal. And told Paul, the guy who goes to Jerusalem is going to wind up this way. And he went anyway. He went anyway. When he gets to Jerusalem, we pick the story up in 21, 17, and 18. It says, after we arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the following day, Paul went in to us, with, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders, Jerusalem, were present. Now, to really understand what goes on there, you need to read 21 through 26 on your own. I don't have time to go through that. But here is the, here is the synopsis of it. Here's what James says in verse 21. James, speaking for the elders once again, says, take them, Jews, and you, Paul, purify them. Notice the word that's used here is not the typical word for purify. This is a word that actually in the, in the English means pure, but it's also the word that comes for holiness. And it means pure in the sense of no guilt of sin. No guilt. Take the Jews and you, Paul, purify them. That was a ritual, an old covenant ritual of the Nazarite vow out of Numbers 9. Are you understanding me? We're in the late 50s. And James is recommending this to Paul. We're not in 40. We're now in the late 50. Okay? You must understand that. Not only did he say, you should do this, but secondly, he said, you should pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads, Nazarite vow, and all will know that there is nothing to the things which are being told about you, which is Paul is teaching people the law is not essential anymore, right? Right? And that's upset James. We're in the 50s, and that has upset James and the elders. I thought we agreed on three things. What's happened to the three things we agreed on by church covenant? Right? That's out the door. That's out the door. Now it's... It's free. Everything is out on the table. Those three ideas are gone. Now he tells him, we ought to do, you ought to do the Nazarite vow with him, and then we can mend the fence because there is a great division of legalism. Yeah, James? There's a great, yeah, really, James? There's a, yeah, Paul, don't bite. Paul, don't buy. Listen, God tried to warn him, don't go to Jerusalem. It is a pig mess. He went anyhow. He went anyhow. I mean, that pains my soul. That pains my soul. It pains my soul what he's got to go through to learn you obey God, not man. You know, what he, you know what he did? He obeyed James and not God. He, obe he obeyed James and not God. And he got himself in a peck of trouble called divine discipline. 
man, who was it that pushed this deal? James. <laughs> James. James says James. In fact, listen to me. James has got worse. Not only, look, I'm not attacking his book. It's in the Bible. But buddy, James isn't. James, James not even with his book anymore. He's freelancing in legalism. Please tell me you got to see that. Gee whiz, people. Certainly you've got to be able to see that. Now, he, now they want him to pay. Notice, listen, look at that. When he says, Paul, you purify him, what's, what, what's it in? It's a present act of what? Imperative. He issues a command to Paul. And then he tells him to pay. What's that? Aorist act of imperative. Listen, this is another warning to Paul that you're in trouble. Who is this man to issue commands over the apostle Paul? Who is he? Is he acting like a pope? Who is this guy? And why does he want him to do it? So that all will know that there is nothing to these things which you've been telling people that the Mosaic law is out. Law is out and grace is in. Now watch what he says. Now watch this. But you, Paul, watch what he says. But you, Paul, yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. I mean, he thinks he has so much authority over this whole shooting match. And yet I what? Paul let him. Paul let him. My heart pains. Let me tell you, there's a real fight. If you listen, it it listen. I've never fought anything more in my life over any issue in the Bible than law versus grace. Never. Never. So I get fired up sometimes when I find people with the law trying to push law upon me. I don't care where I find it. Paul, watch this now. Paul, in the mid-50s, in writing to the Corinthians, listen to what Paul said. This is early. This is early 50s. When James gets a hold of McGinn, he's in the late 50s. In the very early 50s, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, to the Jews I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law. So that I might win those who are under the law. You understand that? He said that in the early 50s. Here he's in the late 50s. He's gone against his own teaching. Has he gone against his own teaching? I'm not trying to, not trying to pick on either one of these. God knows I've got enough of my own to have anybody pick on me with it. I'm just telling you what the Bible has said about these guys. And what kind of expense is this? Now watch this. This is where it just irritates me. Because we're in the late 50s of Christianity. In Acts 21, 21 through 22, the NIV, in a footnote, tells you in detail, uh, uh, in, in synoptics, what is said in detail in Numbers 9, 9 through 12, about the Nazarite vow. Paying part of all, part or all the expenses of the sacrificial victims meant eight pigeons and four lambs. Eight pigeons and four lambs in the 50s of the church age where the new covenant has now been established and the writings are going out strong? Are you kidding me? Listen, all that was took care of when Christ died on the cross. 
Our sins are washed by the blood of Christ, not the animals. Listen, in fact, the animal blood never took away sin. It pointed to Christ who would come to take away sin. You need to read Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. My heart just is, aches for this stuff. And the writer goes on to say, this was living in obedience to the law. Paul lived in obedience to the law in this act, and boy, does God drop the hammer on him. He dropped the hammer on him. You know, man, I just, I feel so bad for him. I feel so bad for him. Now, here, here's my point three in closing. That's kind of a big summary, so it won't, you won't be out in a minute. Here is what you may be missing from James 4, 6 through 10. First, that James gave 10 aorist imperatives that must be absolutely obeyed. In James' mind, that's why in the aorist imperative. And for him, it was the recovery from hedonism, reversionism. We start with a central theme. And a central promise. He gives greater grace. Therefore, God is opposed to the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. I do believe that. And then he, he, he starts out. Submit to God. Submit to God. He said, this is the first thing. And certainly it is. Huputaso tells us that in some, when you submit to God, there must be a respect for the chain of divine command. Respect. Submit to God means a respect for divine authority over your life. 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, verse 3 talks about this divine chain of command in marriages and families, in businesses, in your personal life. There must be a healthy respect for submission to God. I agree. Resist the devil. Notice the word is made up of two words. It's antihistamy. 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 The word histamy means to stand. And histamy means under. And it means to stand in opposition. Resist the devil. That's the spiritual warfare in it. Stand in opposition to the devil and everything he stands for. Matthew, the first chapter, 1 through 11, Jesus did it when he fought him. Coming out of the, remember the 40 days in the wilderness and he fights him? He fights him with the word of God just like we're supposed to in Ephesians 6, 17. We're supposed to fight him with the word of God. But you got to know the word of God to fight him with the word of God. You got to have a weapon. You say, well, I got a Bible. Yeah, but you can't hit him with a Bible. You got to stick him with a sword. And the sword is the word of God that's resident and functioning in your life. You got to hit him with a sword. The Machaira sword. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, 10 through 17, is a spiritual war. You got to resist the devil. I couldn't agree more. You got to draw near to God, and he gives a promise. You got to draw near to God. The word in the Greek language means you got to be approachable to God. Draw near to God. You've got to draw near to God. That's the reason I use the prodigal son. How did he draw near to God? He came to a sentence and says, I'm leaving the world. I'm going back to the Father. I'm leaving the world. The world sucks. It has drained everything out of my life but my life. And before they get that, I'm going home. Wasn't he smart? They took everything he had, took everything they had and stripped him naked. The only thing they were after now was his very life itself. He said, I'm going home before they take that from me. That's the reason I use that parable. It means approachable. Here's one. Uh, Hebrews 4.16. Tells you to approach the, the throne of grace. Draw near to the throne of grace. That you can find uh, mercy and grace in time of need and help. Listen, the reason it's approachable, the reason God is approachable 
is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ and grace. It's, it's, listen, if you're going to come home to the, to, if you're going to draw near to God, then you've got to understand th that it's the throne of grace. It's not the throne of law. It's the throne of grace. To draw near to God is all about grace. It's all about grace. For by grace are you saved. For by grace are you, you living. Grace supplies your need. You're going to die in grace. You're going to go to surpass grace. It's all about grace and not about law. Zip over and out. But I know that because I live in the day of the canon, completed canon of scriptures. I've got all of this. I've got Galatians. I've got, I've got all of these great teachings out of Paul and Peter and John. That just tell you, tell you, tell you, and tell you again how important God's grace is to your life. I wasn't in the early struggle. I didn't understand all that early struggle as these guys did. But I know James didn't progress in it. Whatever he had in the fourth, in the in the book of James when he wrote it, whatever he had went rotten. Now, whether he may have recover from it, I don't know, because nobody knows the life end of it. But I, I, I studied him. I searched him out in the Bible and studied him very carefully. And I report to you what I report to you. And so submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God. These are great principles. And I put you scriptures with it. You know what? I love, you know what I love about Hebrews? You know what he said about the old covenant? It's weak. Here's what, the old, here's what they said. It's weak, it's useless, and can do nothing to make one complete or whole or perfect. Can do, can do nothing. <laughs> can do nothing. Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. It can do nothing. The Mosaic law makes, listen, they... The writer of Hebrews says the Mosaic law makes nothing perfect. Then why did God give it? To point you to Christ so you can be saved by grace. Because you can't by law. The word cleanse. It's very important that you look at this word when it says your hands. There were two things that were cleansed from defilement of the world. And it was washing with water, not blood. You didn't wash your hands with blood. You didn't wash your feet with blood. You, that's not how you cleansed them. It was with water. It was with water. You should read. I don't think I wrote this down, but it should be there. You should read Luke 11, 37 through 39 about ceremonial washing. Mm -hmm. Luke 11, 37 through 39. He was invited to a Pharisee's house. They got a really upset when he deliberately did not wash his hands before he ate. Ceremonial washing, not hygiene, ceremonial washing. And they got all over him. And he said back, and he said, well, you know, you guys are, are good about cleaning the outside of cups and dishes. But you don't pay any attention to the inside. No more than yourself. Inside you is corruption. Evil and robbery. That's what he told him. I guess he didn't get dessert that day. He probably had no dessert. No blackberry cobbler for you, bud. That's very important you go it. So when you, when you attach 1 John 1, 9 to this, you're out of context. You can do that, but you got to tell everybody, I'm going to show you something about this. James would be a little, a, bit, a little upset with that because he put it in aorist imperative. And he knew exactly what he was talking about, whether you do or not. He was talking about cleaning your hands. In the ancient world, you cleaned your hands and you cleaned your feet because of the defilement of the world. And the tradition of the elders pounded this like crazy. They had all kinds of tradition or ideas about that. 
In fact, you'll you recall when Jesus sent his guys out and he said, you go to a city and doesn't receive you, what did he tell them to do with the dust on their feet? Wash them? No, what did he tell them to do? Told them to shake it off. Told them to shake it off. It's not worth. It's not, it's not worth your trouble, your time, or your money. If they're not going to listen to you, move on. If they're not receptive to the thing, you got to learn. You got to move on. Shake the dust. He said, shake the dust. Bend down, but wash your feet. Shake the dust. But this is part, the cleansing. See, we use it for the blood of Jesus and the confession of personal sin. You can do that if you want to, but context is important. It was never the blood. The blood wasn't the issue in ceremonial washing. The water was. Now, if you want to use, if you want to use this, if you want to use Ephesians 5.26, you can do that. You can do that. You can do that. Can't use the blood because it's not correlated. But you can use Ephesians 5.26 when he's talking to the, about the church. He says that he might sanctify her. He's talking about the husband loved the wife. He's talking about as Christ loved the church, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water at the word. If you want to do that, it's legit. But you have to stay hermeneutical solid. If you're going to change what James says, if you're going to change it washed with blood, then you've got to give a heads up on it. But that's the way most people interpret that. It, you got, but you've got to make a heads up on that. You've got to give a heads up on that. Can't do that hermeneutical without giving people a warning. Okay, look, we don't believe that today. We're not into washing ceremonials. And so the, what, how do we use it? You can use First John that way. But hermeneutically, you have to tell your people that. Purify. This Notice it's a different, he, the different Greek word, this word we've seen earlier. It means to be pure from the guilt of sin or the guilt of something under the law. But we would call it the guilt of sin. A 2 Corinthians 7.11 is going to use this word with, in regard to godly sorrow. In 1 Timothy 5.22, the writer uses it, keep yourself free from sin. Now he says, purify your what? Your hearts. You double-minded. You see? And what's he after? You got to come back into single-mindedness. Now, does James mean law? Well, who knows? You don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to teach that. Because when we teach it, double-mindedness <laughs> under New Covenant theology, we may need to come back to the Word of God. James certainly means to come back to the Word of God. James certainly means that. What his view is, I don't know. He just tells you you have to purify your hearts. You know, you have to purify your hearts. You have to purify your hearts. You're double-minded. You've got to become single-minded. It's important you be single-minded in the Word of God. That's why they had the church conference, to be single-minded, of one mind. Christ wants you to be one mind with what? With Him. And if you are, you've got to be 100% grace. You can't be 90% grace and 10% law. You can't be 90% law and 10% grace and say you've got grace. Law nullifies grace. At least that's the New Testament teaching. And so if double-mindedness means old, old, old man, cosmos diabolical thinking versus new man, right? That's fair. That's, that's hermeneutical and that's fair. Then he says be miserable. This word is interesting. He's got two Greek words. Pay attention to the word P-O-R-E-O. -E this is where you get callous from. Bob did a whole deal on this deal when he talked about reversionism, hardness of heart, and callousness on the soul. That's where this idea, when he, and that's a, that's a part of that, de developing this in your life, developing uh, callousness, uh, or it's translated also in the Greek to be afflicted, from this hedonistic reversionism. In other words, listen, the, like the prodigal son, he had to become sick of being sick. He had to become sick of the world. He had to become sick of being sick of the world before he was willing to come to a census and come home. You know that? Listen, for some people, that's the journey they have to take. 
until their nose is rubbed into, into the pig pen, until they're just rubbed in it before they come to their senses and go like this. I, and listen, if they don't, they will die there. And he says, and so this is like a man to be miserable. Be miserable. Mourn. The word in the Greek language, it refers to external grief of, uh, of the personal sin of hedonistic reversionism. It's external grief. And you know what the grief is from? Life choices. Making bad choices in life. Listen. Making bad choices. The prodigal son is a great example of bad choices. Not just one to leave home, but a series of bad decisions that left him penniless uh, in a pig pen. Bad choices. Be miserable and mourn over your... So why? See, don't make them again. Weep. This is an external grief. This is more, this is more than... This is external grief of personal sin. This is from personal misery. This is when you reflect on yourself and see how much misery you have caused to yourself. The other one is when you realize it, it's how much pain and misery you've caused other people. Weeping is when it becomes enormously personal and involved. And it's just how much misery you have caused yourself. Judas, when he discovered that, guess what he did? He went into remorse and he committed suicide. And the, th the other one, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Now, that's not a happy picture. Huh? No happy about that. And yes, it's, these are, this be turned is an aorist imperative. It's a hut to command. Here's what that word be turned means. In the Greek language, it means to ch to change to something different. And here's what he's talking about. Look. People in, in, in hedonistic reversionism, they start out laughing at everything. Then they start laughing at themselves. And at some point, that's got to turn to mourning. M-O-U-R-N. And if it doesn't, you are never going to find your way out. You're never going to find your way out. You're going to be stuck in the pig pen until it eats your life, your very life out of your being. And you know what? You know what I fear about America with their devaluation of life? You know what I'm afraid of? Because we have, we, have, we have devalued life to unbelievable states. Would you agree with that? We will live in a time, probably before most of us die, when a person can die on the street and be viewed like a carcass of a, a cat. Or a wild animal. You want somebody else to pick up and get out of there because I'm tired of looking at it. You won't do it, but somebody must be paid to do this. When you start devaluating human life, and boy, we have done it. We're in a mess. People, listen. Here's what people say. And it's only going to get worse. They say, when I was a kid, they would say, "If you you, you made your bed, lie in it." I didn't. That didn't make any sense to me anyhow. But you, I know what they mean because they would illustrate it. Well, they've brought this up on themselves. Let them figure their way out. Hmm? Maybe. Depends. They can't figure their way out. There's some point they can't get out. They are so deep 
into the cave, they don't remember where the door is. They don't remember how they got in it. I was at a party one night. Early, they can tell you. One night, I was at a party, and, and somebody gave me something, and I, I took it, and I got hooked. One night. One night, I got hooked. Couldn't get off from it. At some point, they won't even remember that. They won't even remember when it began. I dealt with these people. Listen, your laughter must change. Your laughter be turned to something different into mourning and your joy, the joy of the journey that you're in, prodigal son, has got to turn to gloom. And did it? Did his laughter turn to mourning? Did his joy turn to gloom? Yes, it did. James says that if you get in this state of hedonistic reversionism, Put God off on the side and make your journey in it. This is what's going to happen within it. This is the journey that's going to be in it. And you, if you're going to do that, then here's the course you're going to ride. And this is the course that's going to be tough in your life. Now, homiletically and hermeneutically, this is what you get out of what James is saying. And I've given him the best of opportunities to explain it to you. I have been honorable to the hermeneutics of whatever reason God wanted that in that piece of paper. I have been, I have been ascribed to hermeneutics. My first law of responsibility is to the text, to the writer, and to the book alone. And then I move to wh how can I make this possible? My people can understand this. Because we live in a period of grace and grace alone. And what a wonderful period you and I live in. We don't live in this transitional period like James. So maybe I was too hard on James. I don't know. Maybe I'm too hard on him. Maybe I was. Listen to Proverbs 14, 13 when we close. Hey, listen. Before I get to that, listen to this. I wrote this down. Listen. This, what James is saying, is not remorse. Remorse, that we're not talking about remorse. But listen, what he's talking about is a, a, a sense of loss of fellowship, like the prodigal son. You, what really came to his senses when he saw the loss of what he, what he lost in going to the world, what he lost. And his desire was to go back and see if I could just get in the periphery a fellowship. He didn't ever dream that he could ever get back into the favor of, of his father. He just thought, if I could get back into his presence, are you with me? Not into the father's house and into the father's favor, if I could just get back into his presence. That's the reason I love that story with what James was trying to teach us. I felt that it had James set under Jesus' teaching, rather than reject it in the early days of his life, he'd have had a whole much better perspective on what Jesus came to do and why that was important. The, pro the parable of the prodigal son is marvelous for the transitional period of what James is in the midst of. That parable, in my, at least in my perspective, fit perfect for what James was trying to teach us. So I jumped right into that idea. But it's a sense, what James is trying to do, there has to be a sense of the loss of fellowship with God like the prodigal son had, the loss of the sense of fellowship. Listen, that if you get into sin and stay, 1 John 1, 5 through 10, the whole idea of it in that whole passage, which is an a priori argument, that whole passage is all about the loss of fellowship. The whole thing, sin separates you from fellowship, not relationship. God is still your father. That's the story of the prodigal son. It's a wonderful Sin should cause, you, should cause you to have a sense of the loss of fellowship. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, the truth of the Word of God, the way He works things in your life and teaches you. Listen to Proverbs 14, 13. Even in laughter, the heart may be in pain. 
and the end of joy may be grief. Since James is in the book of Proverbs, I'm thinking maybe that's behind James. When he says, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Even on laughter, the heart may be in pain and the end of joy may be grief. Now, they, you can take that a lot of ways, can't you? I mean, I've seen that work a lot of ways. Maybe because he's in the book of Proverbs, third chapter, as he opened up our study. Did you notice what I did to the six steps? That did not have a promise in order to get to new covenant grace teaches to the humble with a promise. I tried to walk you through it hermeneutically. That's my first law of responsibility. To try to figure out what is James saying in the period in which he's teaching. And what are the struggles going in his life. And what do I know about James. So. I wrote down some passages that have been well worth your time. Humble, of course, is an aorist imperative. Humble, which means to come to a grace of reality, of grace orientation. You know, you can be taught it. You can be taught orientation to grace. But it's the reality of the function of it. It's not just the learning of it. It's the living of it. And so my pastor taught a principle about that. He called it grace orientation. Grace orientation to your life. Always stay grace oriented. Whatever's coming into your life, no matter what your life is going through, always stay oriented to grace. Always stay. No matter what is on your plate, always stay oriented to grace. Don't fall apart. Don't do this. Don't do that. Stay oriented to grace. And so the word humble, the, ref the side effect of grace orientation in a practical way is humble. You become humbled. When the prodigal son went home, was, was he humbled by his experience? Yes, but listen, listen, yes, by his experience, but listen, by his journey back. It's when he become grace oriented that all of his uh, inner functioning of his life, the inner... Like, In 1 Peter, 3rd chapter, verse 8, when this subject is talked about, he talks about, and this is, listen, this is what I'm talking When I say grace orientation, listen to me now. Look up here. He's talking about humbleness in your spirit. 1 Peter 3, 8 says, humble in your spirit. Not just in your mind, but in your spirit. That's the practical application of, of grace orientation Grace orientation is being able to be oriented to grace no matter what's coming across your plate in your life. It doesn't matter. God doesn't pass off on anything that's not important to your life. So you got to stay grace oriented about it. You got to stay grace oriented. And, and, and listen, when you become humble in your spirit, and that's what the point of it is. Well, listen, when, when the prodigal son went back to the father, he was humble. And you know who checked him out right away to see if he was humble? Who checked him out right away to see if he was humble in his spirit? His brother, his legalistic brother, checked him out quick. Humble in your spirit. Humble. 1 Peter 3, humble in your spirit is what I'm talking about. When I talk about grace orientation, I'm talking about humble in your spirit. It's a natural flow of existence because you're grace oriented in your life. Humility about what God gives you, the humility. I'm okay with it, Father. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. At some point, we all have to become that, like Paul did in 2 Corinthians 12, 8, when God loaded up his plate and he prays and he prays and God doesn't remove it. He says, listen, okay, your grace is enough. That's grace orientation. That's in his spirit, isn't it? That's in his spirit. That's not his brain. That's not in his... That's not in his mind. That's in his spirit. The spirit. Spirit. And, and listen, that 1 Peter 5, 5 through 11, well worth your read because it goes into the same context as, as James does. 
And you see how Peter approaches it is really interesting. And listen, when he says, humble, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will what? Exalt it. He will lift you up. He will. Look, look, look you're missing it. That's okay. Your whole, your whole deal is to get into his presence. You can't get there without Christ, can you? No man comes to the Father. Let, get into his presence. Listen, when, when, you have a, when you have a humble spirit, you can step, you're in his presence all the time. All the time. You would think that just getting into the presence, the prodigal son, it was enough just to get back into the presence of the father, wasn't it? But you know what the father did? He exalted him. How did he do it? He, yeah, he embraced him. He ran to him. He embraced him. He loved him. Then he put on the royal robe, put on the royal rig, and put on the royal rebox. And you know what that is? That's not standing in his presence. What is that? That's being exalted by his presence. Isn't it? That's why God wants to love you. He wants you to be humble in spirit so you'll live in his presence. Be grace oriented. Live in his presence. When his presence is enough. When his presence is enough. And in his presence, because of the humble spirit, he will exalt you in ways that you will never imagine. You'll be exalted by God in ways. And this is why your feet are on earth, not why when you get to heaven. Your feet are still on the earth, people. Oh, listen. So I cleaned up my hermeneutics for you. I just slid all by that the other day, and I was reminded that we, we come to class to be, to be taught better, and so I'm going to teach you better. That's, that's where I'm worthy of it. And uh, so, you know, I just went back and showed you what James, at best, what James could say at best, because God put it in the pages. It's certainly worth to give him hermeneutical evidence and rights to it. So I, I came back and did that. Okay? So let's pray. We'll close out this. Or, Father, we're so thankful for your love, mercy, and grace. I am so thankful that I live in a period, Father. I, I, I can't imagine what a difficult struggle it was for James and Paul and these guys in the midst of this great transitional period of so many things being changed dramatically. I am so thankful to be a New Covenant guy. and It's only when I go back to the Old Testament or go to a book, like a book of James and I see these guys really struggling or the book of Galatians and I see the real warfare that's going on. I realize there is a war about grace and law. But we live in a period that's just enormously filled with the truth about grace. Oh, God. We are so blessed to have the new covenant complete the Bible. The new, listen, Father, I'm, it was the new covenant that completed the Bible. It wasn't the old covenant. It wasn't the old covenant. I'm so thankful for that, to be able to be the guy, the teacher of the grace new covenant Bible. I feel so privileged. And what a wonderful congregation I have. Just wonderful learners that want to know more than sometimes I give them. And that's a good reminder to me. Always bring a full good meal. They're worthy for it. And so we thank you for it tonight. Bless us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.